Um, I'm Dave Snadden. I'm the Executive Associate Dean Education, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Daryl Kirch, who's going to speak to us today. Um, Chess has been very efficient, and you've had his short bio, you've had his CV. There's very little else for me to say about Daryl. Um, but I did try and find out a few things that were not in all that stuff. Uh, so so Daryl, as you know, is president of the um, and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges. And um, I think we're really fortunate that he has taken some time out of his schedule to spend a day at UBC um, and, and has come along to speak to us and gets to play with our, our distributed technology. Uh, the things that you might not know about is that um, Daryl was a, a major in philosophy before he became a medical student and then um, embarked on that career that uh, got him to where he is now. And I said to him, so, you know, the things that you've done, what are the things that have, have helped you? And he said, well, one of them is that um, my research expertise was in the area of um, schizophrenia, which has been some of the best, the best training for the current job he's in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he also said he's never really been able to hold a job down, so he's always gone on to new and interesting things. I think more importantly, I, it, you know, for us, I'm a family physician, as many of you are, and I always like to know a little bit about the person. So Daryl's got two daughters. Um, he tells me he's a very bad golfer and that he's a, a, a reasonably bad skier as long as it's on groomed runs. But it's really nice to find that people have got a life outside of very busy roles. So, so Daryl, we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, the podium is all yours. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, it is very loud. Is that a little too loud? Maybe whoever is doing the sound can uh, modulate it, but I feel like I'm projecting uh, uh, a little too loudly. Thank you for, for letting me visit you. You are members of the AMC. The 17 Canadian medical schools are, and many of you participate in AMC groups. Um, so I work for you. Uh, but this has been a golden opportunity for me to learn about some really exciting work you're doing at UBC to try and integrate it into the thinking that I'm, I'm doing about academic medicine and where we're headed, not just in Canada and the U.S., but globally. But the most important thing I've learned today is I found one thing that for me perfectly captures the difference between Canada and the U.S., and I, I told some of you this earlier, and I just, it just was so striking, I have to repeat it. So when I got into an elevator in the building across the street, there was a sign in the elevator that said, uh, no sense, S-C-E-N-T-S, please. You know, this is a fragrance-free zone. I had never seen a sign like that. And that you know, reflects such a degree of consideration for each other. Now, not too long ago, I was at an institution that shall go unnamed uh, that's in Texas, in the United States, and when you walk on the elevator there, uh, there was a sign that said, no firearms beyond this point. <laughs> Canada, the U.S., it's... It's all captured there. So, <clears throat> I don't want to just talk at you. I have some thoughts I want to convey, and then I want to get into a dialogue where we can hopefully learn from each other. And I think, in particular, I think you have a lot. You might be able to teach me uh, about how we can exert our collective leadership. I do believe everybody in this room, everybody watching from the sites is a leader or a potential leader. Uh, to create not just healthier nations, but a healthier globe. So before we uh, uh, go too much farther, though, because we're talking about getting to a healthier globe, it's probably good to think a little bit about where we've been globally in terms of the history of healthcare over the last century. Now, in the United States, <clears throat> there is this prevalent belief that uh, Barack Obama became uh, president with a unique radical social agenda in healthcare, okay? Uh, 
possibly learned from Canadians. I'm not sure. But, but that was the belief. And, and it's so much so that now in the United States, people use the term Obamacare, but often in a derogatory sense, you know, when they're talking about how, how opposed they are to the Affordable Care Act. But I want to put this in the proper historical context, since, since you're very international types, you can tell me who this person is. There's a door prize, right? Is it a Mercedes? Is that the door prize? <laughs> nobody? Nobody at the sites? No. This is Otto von Bismarck. <laughs> Chancellor von Bismarck was not a screaming socialist, okay? And yet he is the father of the concept that for nations to be developed and powerful uh, in the modern era, they need to provide health insurance and a social security safety net. So to say that the uh, notion of providing health insurance and uh, good access to health care is uh, Obama's socialist agenda is wrong. So from now on, I want all of you to stop referring to Obamacare and start calling it auto care. Okay? And just to prove in the United States that this isn't just a democratic issue, Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican bull moose. He want, ran on a platform of national health insurance. FDR tried, Roosevelt, tried, couldn't get there, he got Social Security, but right before he died, he actually proposed uh, an amendment to the Bill of Rights to include health care as one of the constitutional rights. Um, now, there was a liberal, Lyndon Johnson, and he got Medicare established in the U.S. That, that at least extended coverage, but many of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act were first proposed by this administration, Richard Nixon. Nobody has ever called Richard Nixon a socialist. So the point I'm trying to make here, using U.S. at the U.S. experience as the basis, is in, in the world globally, this can't be viewed as a liberal versus conservative issue. It really has to transcend that. And as people who care about health care, we can't fall prey to that trap. Well, the Affordable Care Act started as an attempt to really fix the U.S. health care system. But in the uh, terrible, divisive process that happens in the U.S. Congress, it really got reduced to just an insurance expansion. Even the president stopped calling it health care reform and started calling it a health insurance overhaul bill. And even that almost failed when it was taken to the courts. So last summer, almost a, a year ago exactly, uh, the Supreme Court issued its decision. And it was close, as this headline says. But the United States Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was the key vote. He authored the decision, and here he is announcing it. This is John Roberts, <laughs> Chief Justice. Okay, for those Canadians in the audience, it's not John Roberts. <clears throat> but he upheld the mandate. Now, unfortunately, they had another decision that, that tends to undermine it, which is they said the states didn't have to expand Medicaid. And so there's still a lot of flux at work here. But that's 100 years of history in a few minutes. The reality today is the Affordable Care Act is just starting to have its impact. You have universal uh, health insurance. We still have the Americans out in the uninsured coal. So now let's talk about uh, the fact that if we've had all these efforts over time, and it's been incremental, if even the ACA in the United States is, is really just an insurance expansion, why should any of us believe that this is a seminal time for global transformation in healthcare? Well, I think this time is really different because we face a set of realities unlike anything uh, certainly my generation has ever seen. The first reality is political. And again, this is geared toward my perspective as a citizen of the United States. And in the discussion, I want you to tell me 
if there are parallels for you in Canada. But in the United States, uh, uh, I have I can tell you the political reality with one picture and a couple words. This is the picture, and these people don't like each other. So you've got the Democrats and their leadership in the Senate and the House on the left, and you've got the Republicans on the right. And any, are there any skilled psychologists who can interpret the facial expressions here? We are gridlocked. We are not getting anything done. Most of the political energy coming from both sides is going into blocking the work of the other side. Um, speaking of facial expressions, so we've got Vice President Joe Biden there next to Obama, and then just next to him is the Senate Majority Leader, a fellow named Mitch McConnell from Kentucky. I want you to look at the, the expressions on their faces and note how similar it is to Chief Justice Roberts. Where was he? I can't get back. Do you remember that fist? It's the same expression. Ah, I'm going to back up here. I did myself in. So why is, is this gridlock, this divide, have me so worried? It's because it's not going away, it's deepening. And the reason it's not going away in our country, in my country, the United States, is there's a 24-7 barrage of people on the left and right throwing gasoline on the fire. So you may not ever have heard of these people. I bet you've heard of Rush Limbaugh. Uh, he can be a bit over the top. But so can, can Chris Matthews and Keith Oberman on the left. And, and what the American people have done is they've stopped listening to anything on the, on the side they don't like, and they're caught up in the bubble of what they want to hear. And each side, both are guilty, you could argue who's more guilty, have started to make up their own facts. Now, I had my research associate try to find the equivalence in Canada and we really couldn't. Actually, you guys have a sense of humor. Um, you apparently have your parallels to the humorous political satires on the left that appear in the U.S. I've never heard the, the shows on the right, but apparently they're the equivalent of Colbert and uh, John Stewart's Daily Show. So maybe you're better off. Maybe your positions aren't so hardened. I don't know. I do know, from what I could learn, that you're kind of still uncertain about what you are as a nation? Are you getting more liberal? You know, the data seem to indicate that, but then uh, uh, a study shows that you, you think that the general population believes you're actually moving right. So it isn't that you're, you're free of division. It looks like you have that same issue of two sides, one of which is more inclined to think of government as a, as a solution, one of which is more inclined to think of government as the problem. The net result of all this is I think our political reality is, whether you're in Canada or the U.S., the problems that exist in our health care system are generally not going to be fixed by government. You know, the government may make funding decisions, but I don't think they're necessarily going to fix the system. Now, we could be amused by what goes on in our government. We could say this is just absurdist political theater, there for our entertainment, if there wasn't another reality that's been layered onto this over the last seven years, and that's the global economic reality. Now, I know that Canada was not hit as hard as some nations in the European Union or as the U.S., but you're not thriving necessarily the way you'd like to. Um, and, you know, if you see a report like the Reuters report, uh, we are so tied together that unless enough, especially of the developed countries, are doing well, we all suffer. You know, one of us sneezes, all of us catch a cold. So we have this global economic reality 
Now, how does this tie back into health care? It's captured for me in this article, which you can't find anywhere but online. <clears throat> it's called The End of the Third Bubble, and it's written by somebody named uh, Neil Hogan, who's a PhD with a consulting firm. And uh, again, I'm not sure the degree to which Canada was affected, but he talks about two recent bubbles. So in the U.S. in 2000, there was a tech bubble. And did that have an effect on Canada? Probably. Um, and he talks about all the economic dynamics that drive bubbles, about how prices increase beyond reasonable levels, and then it, it, the bubble burst. Uh, he, he taught me things I didn't know. I'm not an economist. I didn't know that, that in, historically there was even a bubble around tulip bulbs and the prices of tulip bulbs. And he said they all have the same dynamics, whether it's tulip bulbs or tech stocks or housing prices. Now, again, I don't think Canada was hit as hard by the banking and housing bubble bursting, but it really hurt the United States. And, and six years after it started, most areas have not even come close to recovering. Well, guess what he thinks the third bubble is, especially in the U.S., but he thinks the whole globe is vulnerable to it, health care. He says that if you look at health care, the rise in cost and spending on health care in the developed nations, it has all the same properties that you see in other economic bubbles. By way of illustration, this is from a website called Gapminder. It's really a fascinating website with great, you know, one picture tells it all images. So the way to know this or explain this is even if you can't see the details, the vertical axis is your health spending per capita, right? The horizontal axis is your income per capita. The size of the circle is your population, right? So you've got China and India. You see the two biggest circles on the bottom. Uh, for Canada, you are sitting somewhere down uh, about 40% of the way down below the U.S. and a little to the left. I'll give you the exact numbers in a minute. Now, there's a theory that's been afoot that it's okay for all of us to develop nations to spend so much on health care because we're wealthier. You know, that when you are as wealthy as the United States, why not spend 20% of your gross domestic product on health care? When you're as wealthy as Canada, why not spend 12%? You know, that that's going to be fine because we'll just keep getting wealthier. So this was 2000. Let's follow the United States, but also look at what happens to the bubbles, including Canada. I should have circled Canada for you on the, the bottom there, uh, just down and below. And watch what happened over a decade. It even looks like a bubble, <laughs> physically. Now, what you noticed, if you watched the United States, was we actually didn't move to the right in terms of wealth. We took a jog to the left when the recession hit. If you look at the developed nations below, their upward movement was greater than their rightward movement. By definition, this proves Neil Hogan's hypothesis that we have all the economic dynamics of a bubble at work in the Canada, in the U.S., in, in, in the EU, and elsewhere around health care spending. Now, you're a very astute audience, and you can see... Let me see if I can get my pointer here. You see this country, right, almost as much as the U.S. in spending and even a little wealthier. Why can't we be like them? That's Monaco, folks. <laughs> Not exactly like Canada or the U.S. So the real concerning news is that now there's a literature appearing in the United States, and I don't know if you see it in Canada, that talks about higher education being a bubble. You know, as tuition costs are going up, there was even a cover of Time or Newsweek 
a few months back that said, is, higher, is college worth it anymore? And you may be having some of these discussions even about higher education in Canada. What this means, though, is if people are saying health care spending looks like a bubble, higher education looks like a bubble, guess what? We're living in the middle of two bubbles right now in an academic health center like this one. Not a particularly uh, safe place to be, in my view. It demands action. That's our economic reality, but we've talked about a political reality in which that action is unlikely to come from our federal governments or our provincial governments or state governments. Now, I could get to this point. I could have even shown those diagrams and said, you know, it's okay. What you spend in Canada, what we spend in the U.S. is fine if I was thrilled about our outcomes. Now, in in terms of what we spend, these are the data I was alluding to generally. These are the exact numbers. That 11.3% headed toward 12, and ours is headed quickly, unfortunately, to more like 20% of GDP. If the outcomes matched that, I'd feel actually pretty good about it. Uh, I feel ashamed of the U.S. outcomes. Uh, you know, compared to the OECD countries, uh, these are pathetic. You're better, but still not, you know, top of the, of, uh, uh, the developed nations. The, um, the, the difference, I guess, is you're getting more value clearly than we are because there's your spending, you know, at, a, at uh, roughly... 55 to 60 percent of our spending, and you're getting better outcomes. Uh, I just, I can't, I have a struggle every time I travel internationally because I'll be meeting with a group of healthcare people from whether it's Singapore or Germany or uh, the UK, and uh, oh, after dinner, especially if they've had enough to drink, they'll say, How do you Americans stand it? How can you spend so much and not be just ashamed of? you know, where you are in, in things like infant mortality. We spend a lot. Now, you're a wise audience, and I'm really impressed at the degree of thought. I see everywhere, from the design of the new curriculum uh, to some of the topics that the chess group takes on to some of the things I see on your website, you're aware of a very important fact here, and that is that what you spend on medical care is not the only determinant of your health outcomes. So uh, I think part of your strength is that you pay a good amount of attention as a nation to the fact that these things influence your, your health care outcomes. At the U, in the U.S., we haven't figured that out. Look at our social spending. This is the same placement of countries on the, or, the array. So. The bottom line is that, that uh, we spend uh, a, a much smaller percentage of our GDP on social programs, education, housing, and the like, and then wonder why we spend so much on health care and don't get good results. I don't think it's that much of a mystery. Uh, I'm really struck by Canada's um, relative balance, you know, I think that it may be that you're uh, modeling for the rest of the world that there has to be a kind of, um, I don't, not exact equality, but, but there has to be a parity between investing in health care and, and investing in social programs. The um, other element that worries me about our health care system is we have these 50 million insured, and we have a lot of data that we already are facing physician shortages. I don't know what the magnitude of the baby boom was in Canada. Was there a baby boom in Canada? Um, you know, this, as, as, as I approach it, I'm not sure I like the phrase, but the silver tsunami, you know, is about to hit health care, and unfortunately, most, most of them 
uh, are like me. I may not be a great skier, but I plan to ski until I'm 90, even if every joint is titanium. You know, it's going to create a lot of demand for health care. So we were already, with the baby boom demography, projecting shortages. If we get some people health insurance, the data are very clear that it will deepen those shortages. So we're also facing a physician shortage that is only going to worsen our, our inequities in health. So, uh, I'm, I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I never intentionally depress people. Uh, I'm looking at my fellow psychiatrist for validation of that. Why do I paint this picture of such stark realities globally, not just for the United States? Why do I think we're all in this together? And I do it because I think it's a call to action. It's the case statement for us to engage, whether it's UBC or one of the U.S. schools, to engage in transformational work to create a different future. Instead of a future that looks like bubbles, health inequities worsening, access problems from doctor shortages, can we come together to create a better kind of future around health globally? Well, the kind of future I think we want in health, I, I'm personally a big fan of someone you may or may not have heard of, Don Berwick, uh, creator of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, did his best to head the Center for Medicare and Medicaid in uh, the United States. And Don, he's not the first person to use the term, but he really popularized the term that we all have to globally start focusing on the triple aim that we need to do better care for individuals. He would focus especially on chronic disease management and prevention, which we do so poorly on. In the U.S., we can rescue just about anybody. The problem is that we let them get there to where they needed rescue. So we need better care for individuals, but we also need to show the population health indices improving and we need to prove value. We actually need to get a handle on the per capita cost issue. It's the triple aim, and it makes a lot of sense to me. If government, though, in the U.S. is totally paralyzed, and if in Canada it has divisions, it's not going to come up with visionary solutions. <laughs> if our global economic constraints are such that we don't have loads of money to just throw at the problem, it's going to take some real creative efforts. And it's going to require that we, teaching hospitals, physicians, medical schools, start becoming the solution. Uh, I don't know if you ever hear this uh, from the provincial government or others, but in the United States, I, if I go to Congress and sit with a member, all too commonly they'll say, you guys are the problem. You're you are teaching students to get enamored of all this technology. You're not teaching them how to use resources well. You know, you're failing to do good preventive care. You just are, are like the good big subspecialty procedures. We get positioned as being the problem. And that when it comes to medical errors, uh, we are not giving attention that it's all about our margin as opposed to, to end-of-life care, quality, and the things we should be attending to. That's the case statement. And what we need to do is turn that around. To do so, I would argue, means we are simultaneously, and I saw signs of this at work today, we simultaneously have three redesign efforts to do. One is health care reform. You have a better system than we have, but... Do any of you claim your health care system has been perfected? No. What I believe you've done in that bottom circle is you at least don't complicate the system with huge numbers of uninsured patients. That's an obstacle in the U.S. But do people get paid in Canada for value, for population outcomes? Not to my knowledge. And in the U.S., the, you know, the world's capital of fee-for-service medicine, people don't get paid for outcomes, they get paid for volume, especially volume of interventions. 
So we have the uninsured problem, you don't, but we both share the problem that we don't have value-based payments that are incentivizing people economically to do the right thing, prevention, population health improvement, and the like. Do you have workforce problems? I think you do, right? Um, do you have more than enough postgraduate positions for your medical school graduates? We don't in the US. Have you perfected in the hospital, which I guess is above us now, have they perfected a workforce that is totally interprofessional, high-performing teams? Not quite there yet. So we all have work to do on that. And our care models, you know, do we have do we have the kinds of chronic disease management care models that keep people out of the hospital? You know, again, I think there are signs you're better at it than we are in the US, but neither of us have perfected it. And I bet, you, you, you will have to tell me, I bet there are two other problems we share. Uh, one is patient expectations. Now, in the US, this is an extreme issue. Uh, we have a philosophy as citizens of the United States, and that philosophy is essentially every boo-boo and owie deserves an MRI. You know, it's that notion that we should just get it all, the best, immediately, whether it's indicated or not. Uh, I don't know if you've managed expectations in Canada, if people are willing to accept some of the constraints that good stewardship of healthcare resources, good practices of evidence-based medicine deserves. I know for us that's a huge problem, and I'm not sure, even if you are better around utilization of resources and patient expectations, I doubt that you've gotten patients to a level of health literacy that can make them full participants in the shared decision-making that they need to do. So that's a problem we share to one degree or another, and here's one I know we share that I'm going to return to later, and that's the culture of this medical school and this teaching hospital, and we'll talk more about that. That is hard enough to redesign that healthcare model is huge work. Uh, I heard a great metaphor. Somebody said this is like redesigning an airliner in flight. You know, it's not like we can stop taking care of patients for five years while we figure it out and fix all the gaps. It is a big task. It would be big enough on its own, but you've got another problem that you're working on very diligently with your curriculum renewal, which is we like to pretend we have a true continuum of medical education all the way from pre-med to practice, but instead what we have, I'm sorry, what we have is a series of compartments. You know, you have pre-med, and all that pre-meds in the U.S. think about is how do I get accepted and get a good MCAT score? Are they thinking about, do I have the right temperament, personality, characteristics to be a good physician? Um, you know, we've created a system where there are all these discontinuities in the system that distract our students. So your curriculum renewal can't just compartmentalize the world into... Um, Here's a box, there's the test, here's a box, there's the test, here's a box, there's the test, all the way across up to specialty certification and the like. You really want to be building, and I was very impressed by what I saw when I met with members of the group. You want to be building something that's being built with the end in mind. What are the competencies you want every physician to have? In what direction do you want them striving toward mastery around those competencies? not can they pass the test. <laughs> this is a big redesign change. So we've added another airliner flying in tandem with the healthcare airliner. Um, and then the third redesign is rethinking our research. You know, I was at NIH for 13 years. I appreciate basic bench research as much as the next person. I participated in it. I'm a big fan of those breakthrough early clinical studies. But we've been out of balance. We haven't paid as much attention to what works in the real world. You know, all these different forms of population research, healthcare delivery research, have been underfunded. I'm not saying that, that 
basic research has been overfunded, but in the United States, these have been underfunded. You can tell me in the discussion whether you think you've got it in balance here. Maybe. I, I imagine it's better, but uh, I'm not sure it's in total balance. You know, will you be able to tell me when I revisit here in a few years what the impact on community health indices has been from the regional campuses? You know, that would be the kind of research that falls in those, those other categories in this cycle. So I don't know, have you ever heard of the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels? These, these precision flying teams that the Army and Navy, or Air Force and Navy have. Um, this is like trying to redesign them, right? A group of airplanes flying in tandem, they're, they're, you, you know, you don't want any of them to hit each other and crash, but you have, they have to be coordinated. Our rethinking of curriculum, of healthcare, and of research has to be operating together. Chess can't operate independently of other forms of scholarship, of what's happening in the delivery system, and so on. So I'm going to finish by coming back to you as leaders. And what I think are some of the critical success factors for us to pull this off. I'm not going to, to uh, kid you. The reason I like doing these visits, the reason I like giving talks like this, is we need a lot more leaders than we have right now aware of these issues, these challenges, but eager to seize some of the opportunities that exist. I think the path forward involves paying more attention than we have to some, some critically important things. I talked about culture. Uh, for Bob Willard and I, we grew up in medical, I've known Bob for a long time, we grew up in the culture on the left-hand side. I mean, it was hierarchical down to how long your white coat could be and when. You know, just think about our academic titles and our promotion and tenure letters. It was autonomous. You know, it was about me, right? How long is my CV? Competitive, just a bit. Uh, individualistic. Uh, one of the groups who we were talking about this, the psychological testing on physicians is fascinating in that there are two dimensions of psychological testing, the MMPI, where physicians are off outside the usual normal range. <laughs> one is obsessive compulsiveness, which is okay because we have this hand-washing problem that we need to take care of. <clears throat> but the other one is autonomy, individualism. And was it expert-centric? You betcha. You know, it was the patient should feel lucky that they get to see me because I'm the master, the expert. Maybe it's my age or maybe it's my understanding of the healthcare system, but I don't want that culture when I'm a patient. I don't want to be sitting in an ICU bed with seven specialists working on me, none of whom talks to the other in a meaningful way. What I want is a culture that starts with the the medical school training, it starts with the selection of medical students that creates the kind of values that are on the right-hand side. You know, I think uh, uh, I was talking with some of the chess fellows, and in the curriculum review, I think you have opportunities, you have space in the curriculum to actually give attention to some of these issues from the very beginning. I think your admissions processes are more holistic than I see at the, at the average medical school, and I think these are ways that this kind of culture can be built. You know, there's a saying, a business saying in the U.S., culture eats strategy for lunch every day. Uh, culture is all important, and we pay too little attention to it. <clears throat> every time somebody becomes a new dean, uh, I ask them what their plan is, and they say, we're going to do a strategic plan. <laughs> and, and the faculty hears that and goes, oh, not another strategic. I'm yet to hear a dean say, I'm going to do a culture assessment. <laughs> In my view, that's the first priority. Turning from culture and the need to create a different culture brings me to leadership and your leadership. The chalkboard on the left 
really defines the kinds of leaders who are medical school deans uh, when I became one. Um, you can, I think, read, can you read them in the back? Yeah, I'm not going to read them to you. The problem we have is that the leaders we need now, the leaders I see having some success at the big change we need to do, look like the iPad on the right and the properties that are there. I should have said at the outset, I see a couple of you uh, actually jotting notes. These slides are yours, and Glenn or whoever is responsible, if you can make sure they're available to people. Um, I work for you, you're free to use them. Um, let me, but let's focus on just one element to this, because I think this is another area where you've given a lot of attention, and I really admire you. Um, what about this issue of diversity? You know, do we really have an issue there? Do we need to pay attention to it? Uh, I believe we do. Um, the reason I believe we do, if any of you have ever heard or Scott Page or read his book, if you haven't, you should. And he actually has a good YouTube that's very readable. You know, what Scott Page says is so powerful because he's an organizational theorist, and he studies what makes organizations work. And he essentially, he's at the University of Michigan, he essentially says that there is ample evidence now, research evidence, that teams make much better decisions, i.e. exert better leadership than individuals, and that diverse teams make better decisions than homogeneous teams. It is the argument for diversity that's not about quotas, it's not about correcting inequities, it's about being the best we can be. We're still struggling, you know, I'll, I'll just give you some examples that, that I pulled together recently for another reason. Uh, look at, you know, everybody is, is remarking, at least uh, in the U.S. medical schools, about how many women are deans. That's 20 out of 141. <laughs> you know, not exactly parallel to the 50-50 divide of women and men entering medical school now. And then when you get to other forms of diversity, there is a, still a predominance of white males in those roles, that left-hand side of leadership. So if we're going to attain excellence and, but are not attaining diversity in our leadership, we're limiting ourselves. Uh, I, I put this together. These are the, there's this publication called Modern Healthcare in the U.S. that lists the 50 most influential physicians in the U.S., do you notice how few people there are of color and how few women there are in that group relatively? You know, it's a statement that we are out of balance in a way that harms us around attaining excellence. Scott Page would be the first to point that out. So we need leadership that looks that list on the right. We need to gradually erase the list that's on the chalkboard on the left. This has big changes. In one of the groups, we talked about the tenure track. You know, I'm not sure the tenure track promotes excellence anymore. That is a personal view, not necessarily the policy of the AAMC. <laughs> but I can, we can talk about it uh, in the discussion, if you'd like. But I can give you my rationale for that. Um, you know, the, the issue of teamwork and collaboration. Uh, uh, this institution cannot succeed with a, a group of rugged individualists heading departments. Department heads need to function like a team to get us the leadership that we need, and so on. Uh, I actually, some of you were in San Francisco last year, and I talked about this notion of leadership, and, and I have, I'll just close by illustrating the way the, the concept works. Clotaire Rapai, who wrote the book on the left, looks at culture, and, and one of the things he looked at, he's French, but he studied the culture in the U.S. on a number of dimensions, and he said in the U.S., there, there's a culture code word for everything in every culture. Uh, he said that the culture code word for leaders in the U.S. is illustrated, I think, by this slide, Moses. <laughs> you know? This is Gavin Stewart, 
coming down from the mountain. In his right arm is a vision statement, and in his left arm is a strategic plan. It isn't Gavin Stewart? Okay, it's Charlton Heston playing Gavin Stewart. The point is that we've actually believed that, that somewhere there's this great individual who will come down. The person I have been very impressed by, I think some of you may have read the book or heard her at our last annual meeting, is Liz Weissman. Her view of leaders, the kind of leaders we now are, are what she calls multipliers. So a leader is a multiplier if they view their job as not, what do I know, how smart am I, but how do I extract the maximum genius from the people around me? You know, how do I multiply the talent in the institution? So, you know, it's so frustrating. I get called more from the U.S. than Canada around searches for deans, for example, and uh, they say, so what kind of person should we look for? And I say, your whole committee should read the book Multipliers. That's what you need. You know, that's the kind of person who can really lead change in your school. And they say, that's really interesting. Now, do you know any Nobel laureates that we could recruit as dean? Um, you know, I don't know how many Nobel laureates you've worked with. And while they're brilliant people, and I'm glad we have them on the planet, they are not necessarily multipliers. They won their Nobel Prize by being very narrowly focused. So we've got to adopt this concept rapidly, not just talking about deans or department heads. I'm talking about chief residents. I'm talking about student leaders. Uh, I'm talking about the curriculum renewal committee, the chess uh, membership. It's, they've all got to be populated with multipliers. So I think this is my last slide. I, I think we're at a very interesting time. You know, I think for all too many years, everybody viewed excellence, and if you read their strategic plans, often they actually said it, they viewed their excellence as defined by things on the left. You know, we will be in the top 20 of NIH funding. We will have a mean MCAT score of 34 in our admitted class, as if that really carried out their mission. I think the best schools, and I see signs of it in lots of dimensions here, are starting to care more about the right. Why are you here in British Columbia? What does your mission statement actually say you're doing for the, the citizens of the province? What is your relationship to your communities, whether it's Prince George, Victoria, here? Um, why do you do uh, uh, MM, MMMI, did I get it right? Why do you do those kinds of interviews of applicants? Because you care about attributes as much as cognitive ability. Um, educational quality, you wouldn't be putting yourself through the torture of curriculum renewal. You're not masochist. Are you? <laughs> it feels like it. You wouldn't be doing that process if you didn't believe that it was about educational quality. Um, you didn't do chess because you, for pure intellectual curiosity. You did it because you want to really study educational outcomes. Um, and you want the population to be healthier. You don't want them to get sick and need to be rescued in the ICU upstairs or get no prenatal care and end up in the, have a baby ending up in the NICU. That's what I think the new excellence is about. And I've loved my time here today because I see you making so much progress in this direction, which in the end will get us to the triple aim. Thank you. Okay. We have a question here. Move to the microphone and project. Okay. Is this on? Okay. Hi, Dr. Kirch. I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I absolutely agree with the importance of changing culture, but I wanted to, to ask you to clarify one of the earliest points you set out in your presentation, that it is unlikely uh, for federal change to be the biggest, uh, uh, it's, it will, change will unlikely be from the federal level. And I wanted to ask you exactly what your thoughts are in that. 
since it's set out in the constitution that american states are meant to be you know their own laboratories and a lot of american policies are based out on trial by fire what happens on a grassroots level eventually trickles up and then there's some some national change yeah. and my question to you is whether or not there is a realistic way in that with this silver tsunami that the federal government can wait until all 50 states eventually find something good uh, without the adequate funding, uh, without setting the appropriate culture to model for its citizens. I feel that a lot of the infighting and the bipartisan culture pervades every other aspect of life and that absolutely influences the way people work, the way people live. And so I just am curious more about your your opinion on the need for expanding Medicare, expanding Medicaid. Those are both federally funded and so adamantly defended by Americans, and yet those are only for the underserved, low-income, and elderly. Why? Where is this dogmatic shift in that, you know, the federal government isn't at the very heart of, of the future of better health care. The, the reason I said, and I don't want to drag you into the weeds of um, the U.S. political scene, um, but the, the fact is uh, we, the founding fathers in the U.S. designed this system they call checks and balances because fundamentally they were people who fled government. Most of them really didn't trust government and so they created this very balanced government. I don't think they ever imagined that it would become a paralyzed government, but it has. And I don't see it changing in part because, and this is the weeds, the US, uh, uh, in the US every 10 years there's a census and the parties that are in power in the states get a chance to redraw districts in their favor. And so in 2010, uh, the majority of House districts in the U.S. were drawn to be guaranteed uh, Republican states, or districts rather. And uh, the Republican Party, I'm not saying they're wrong or right, but the Republican Party, and even Republicans say this, has now been held hostage by a very strong anti-anti-anti-government wing. And uh, we're going to have in the U.S., and you should worry about this because it'll hurt Canada too, we're actually going to have another one of these, these uh, deadlines around raising the debt ceiling. And there are a significant number of people in Congress who say, let us default. You know, that kind of nihilism is, is paralyzing the U.S. government and it won't change until the districts are redrawn, which doesn't happen until 2020, which won't, won't influence an election until 2022. So um, right now we're left with two things. What the states can do, and some states are putting together some really good models but I think even more importantly for us, what can academic medical centers do to show the way? You know, how can we shift our focus? And I'm not saying we should abandon all the high-end, great, technically sophisticated things we do, but how can we get more engaged in community health, preventive medicine, chronic disease management? So my message is, uh, and, and most political theorists agree, we're just going, going through a decade, we're facing a decade of inaction on the federal level, and so it's going to have to be combined uh, state and academic medical center cooperation. The states that are pulling this off, I don't, again, I, I don't expect you to know the details of U.S. geography, but interestingly, the states that have one academic medical center are, are kind of breaking to the front of the pack. So Utah, Colorado, a lot of them are in the West, New Mexico, Delaware is one, where they're partnering with their state to develop a solution, uh, not just to Medicaid expansion, but to things like the remaining uninsured. And there will still be uninsured even after the ACA. Uh, so they'll lead the way. But, you know, I'm sorry for being so long-winded, but Winston Churchill has that famous quote that captures it 
perfectly he said you can always count on the u s to do the right thing but only after they've tried everything else we are in this process of trying everything else you know will eventually get there through states through leading academic health centers and i think eventually the people will get so fed up with this functional government that they will get you know they'll they'll turn back the clock to when government could actually find a center at the federal level don't i make you glad you live in canada <laughs> in in the back sir Yeah, I obviously placed a lot of emphasis on teamwork and collaboration, and uh, the gentleman made uh, the very correct observation that we've all seen dysfunctional teams. Um, rather than, than uh, go too deep into the topic, two of the most reasonable, uh, readable books on this topic um, one is called The Wisdom of Teams by Katzenbach and Smith. And uh, the other is by an author named Patrick Lencioni. And actually, the Harvard Business Review has good summaries of these. And uh, Katzenbach and Smith talk about how true teams go through a phase of what he calls Storman and Norman. Um, and you'll see this if, if, for instance, I see it when curriculum renewal becomes a topic at a school, often a team will get formed and they'll get stuck in the storming part and not be able to push through it. What they point out is that you have to push through that, but when you do and when you attain certain properties of interacting, you will, you're guaranteed to attain a higher performance level than you did as a committee. Uh, the other book, Patrick Lencioni, is called The Dysfunctions of Teams, and it actually is a primer on why some teams become dysfunctional. But, um, you know, I grew up in a world where health care was viewed as an individual sport. You know, there's no way to play the game now except as a team sport. And so we've got to make teams work and get them performing at their highest level. Uh, and while question. he's checking, one last, yeah. one one last quick question. Oh, from, right here. You have, you, oh. We should give equal time to the sites. Why don't LSC 1001 go first and then I can ask quick questions. Thank you. Um, I worked in various arenas of healthcare since I was about 15 years old and no, I wasn't a doctor. Um, one of the things that I've noted in our healthcare system, which I would liken to the growth of the HMOs in the United States, is the bureaucratization of medicine and the institution of healthcare authorities uh, throughout Canada. These authorities are anti sapient, they are not team players, and they soak up most of our healthcare dollars to the detriment of uh, patients needing care both interventional and preventive. And I wonder if you have any comment on that. Um, I guess everybody could hear uh, the question. Um, I don't know enough about the health care authorities. I have been struck, though, by um, uh, some recent articles in the U.S. about how the health exchanges, the state-based health exchanges, need to learn lessons from what didn't work in the Canadian health authorities, <laughs> um, which I guess speaks volumes. Uh, I think that, that the interesting problem is that we've decided that when, when something isn't working well in healthcare, it must need a regulatory solution, which tends to, to make it even harder to deliver healthcare. And I think part, again, of what I think the leadership in academic medicine needs to do is to say regu regulatory solutions are costly, uh, they slow the process down, and they're not very well focused on patient outcomes. Uh, so what we need to do is shift from always throwing a regulatory solution at a problem to throwing innovation at the problem and putting a lot more power into the hands of providers to innovate 
solutions as opposed to imposing regulations. The regulatory burden, I know in the United States, and those of you who've practiced in the United States, is maddening. Uh, and especially in teaching hospitals, for instance, the supervisory um, constraints around what students are allowed and residents are allowed to do is, is a, a terrible drag on the system. Um, now, the regulatory agencies don't view it that way. They view themselves as the protectors of the public, but you could say that's just their job protection position. Uh, Darrell, I, I, I think we, we should begin to um, wind this up. There's a number of you want to ask questions. So well, those of you here, we can get... Yeah, for the people outside. here, I'll, I'll, I'm going to stay for the, for the reception outside, but there was one other gentleman at one of the sites... Or, I think, yeah, UBC, the video conference... Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Kirsch. Uh, I just want to, first of all, very quickly say that as a preventive medicine believer and philosopher, and also as a team player, I really appreciate the, the time that you have shared with everybody here. My quick question is, in terms of, in one of your presentation slides, uh, you mentioned that the non-tenure one is actually better, and i just like to maybe ask you to quickly elaborate on that, just so that we yeah. can look at that. I knew I'd get into trouble when I said that. <laughs> First of all, the, the fact is, in the United States, the majority of faculty are non-tenure, non-tenure track, predominantly. Now it's almost, I think, two-thirds. Um, and it has really created two classes of citizens and a lot of, I think, unnecessary tension. From a more global view, there was a great article several years ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education. It was actually an editorial. I can't remember who wrote it. And the title of the editorial is, was, What Do U.S. Supreme Court Justices, the Pope, Fidel Castro, and University Professors Have in Common? Tenure. <laughs> and it was a very influential article for me because it, it essentially said, why have we taken one part of our societal fabric and created jobs for life when uh, other people throughout uh, society don't deserve that. Now, I know the original concept was to guarantee political freedom, but I'm not sure that applies in a world where we have constitutional protections and other things. It may have applied in medieval Europe, but I don't know about here. Um, that doesn't mean that I want everybody subject to the whim of institutional changes. My proposal, which I discussed actually with the dean's group, is I think we would be well served to think of shifting academic institutions to a series of contracts of increasing longevity. So you'd enter with you know, perhaps an initial three or five year agreement or whatever. And then as you really proved your value to the institution and to the field in general, you could have a 10-year contract, 10-year, 10-year contract. But the notion of setting something in motion for a lifetime, you know, I think is problematic. And I think it deserves a discussion around issues of fairness uh, and sensibility that we seem loath to discuss. In the U.S. in the medical schools, actually, there is a fair amount of discussion in it. But I'll tell you who squelches it, the larger universities. They do not want to have this discussion. And yet at the same time, if you look at what's happening in U.S. universities, they're creating a terrible two-class system made up of tenured professors with reasonably good compensation and manageable workloads, and they're shifting more and more of the work to adjunct professors, and they carefully keep their employment at the level that they don't even qualify for health care or other university benefits. So how fair is that? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I have this fairness thing. I, you know, it's, uh, someday I have to get over it. So that Thank you so much. Really thank you so much for your teaching. Thank good, you. Good note for us to finish on. Darla, I'd like to thank you very much for for spending the day with us. And um, I'd like you just to show your appreciation in the normal manner. So thank you very much.